Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Healthy Seas Web Lab. We currently have over 200 eco warriors from around the world registered for this discussion. It's such an honor to have you guys here. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, wherever in the world you are, I hope that you guys are safe uh, and in happy conditions. I know it's been a challenging year and uh, it's really important for us to bring these discussions to you and try to see the light on the other side. I am super stoked about today's discussion because we've got two massive eco activists from very different worlds coming together to talk about their experiences when it comes to ghost gear. I'm Guillory Darabi. I'm an environmental filmmaker and correspondent, and I am joined by Pascal Van Erp and Lefteris Arapakis. I'm going to have them introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what they're passionate about and why they're here today. Pascal, do you want to go first? Sure. <laughs> of course. I, I almost wanted to say Lefteris, you can go, but um, thank you. Um, well, my name is uh, Pascal Van Erp. Um, I'm, I'm working as a, a diver coordinator for a Health Seas Foundation, and um, I'm the founder and um, diver. I call myself a diver because I'm part of a team of Ghost Diving Foundation. And the Ghost Diving Foundation is a, uh, an environmental organization, global env environmental organization, consisting of uh, volunteer technical divers operating all over the world to remove lost fishing gear out of the oceans. And um, with Health Seas, we focus on um, uh, circular economy. So uh, we, we make sure that the, the lost fishing gear we pull out of the oceans is as much as possible, recycled, upcycled, regenerated, whatever is possible with it, as long as it's out of the ocean and we can find the next purpose, purpose for it. Brilliant. Nice to meet you. Although we've met before, I got to say the first dive I ever did, the first mission I ever went on was with Pascal, who was making a documentary about healthy seas. And is it fair to say that you saved my life, Pascal, with the scorpion fish? Well, okay, they, they can they can stab you a little bit, but I cannot say that we really saved your life. But uh, it can be a nasty thing if a scorpion fish will hit you. That's true. But you were you were not scared. You were actually coming very close to him because I think you wanted to save him, and that is a very good thing. I was the opposite of scared. Anytime who's been anyone who's been diving, they know when you first open up to that world and to that wonder, it's just like overwhelmingly amazing. Lefteris, tell us your story. Hello guys, hello to everybody that's uh, attending. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm coming from uh, from the surface of the sea, let's say I'm not a diver. So uh, I'm the co-founder and director of Enalia. Enalia is a social startup that wants to make the marine ecosystem sustainable. So. We, we started a few years ago during the economic crisis of Greece because we wanted to fight uh, youth unemployment. Uh, so what we did is uh, we started with the fishing sector. My family have been fishermen for five generations. So we, I knew the sector quite well and I knew that they were seeking for personnel. So that's why we, with some friends, we created Greece's first professional school for fishing, training unemployed people into the fishing sector. We have trained more than 116 people until today. And at the same time, we started training fishermen into sustainable fishing, teaching them techniques where they can uh, earn more money while catching less fish. So yeah, that's, uh, that's from my side. And yeah, I'm really excited to, to join you and discuss with you. And 2020 was a pretty, although it was a very challenging year, it was quite a big year for you. You were, you were given a huge distinction from UNEP. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I got awarded from uh, United Nations Environment Program a couple of months ago as a young champion of the earth for Europe. So I'm representing Europe, let's say, for, for this year for the work that we do in Analia. And Mainly this, uh, this award uh, focuses on the work that we do uh, in a project called Mediterranean Clean Up. So, so the, through this project, what we do is uh, we, we train and empower fishermen to collect plastic uh, from the sea. Uh, these guys, they used to get plastic in their nets and they were throwing it back. I didn't know that. And I realized it when I went on my first fishing trip back uh, back when, when we started in Alia, I was shocked to see that the fishermen were collecting so much plastic in their nets. 
plastic that then they were throwing it back in the sea. Like I remember my first journey, we were throwing back in the sea bottles, uh, a fridge, even a washing machine that we caught. It, it, it was crazy. So after we came to the to the port, uh, we said with the rest of the team, guys, we need to do something about that. So now we work with uh, around a thousand professional fishermen from Greece and Italy. And we collect from the bottom of the sea around four tons of plastic uh, weekly. And then uh, we have also waste management of this plastic. Lots of it comes in collaboration with healthy seas. And yeah, we make sure that this plastic enters again the circular economy. So that's why the UN award was about. Congratulations, that's a big deal. Let's, uh, let's make it, break it down and go back to the basics. What is ghost scare? What is this phenomenon? How did it begin? Um, tell me all about it, Pascal. Well, um, <clears throat> we are talking, the, the, word, the, the word ghost is actually coming from um, something that is unattended, floating around in the ocean and still catching fish. So if you have lost a fishing gear, which is not uh, controlled by fishermen or other people anymore, then uh, it still catch fish because it's a very, uh, very, uh, very good uh, design te technique. It still, it still keeps on catching. So hooks can still catch fish. The, uh, the nets are still catching fish. The, the lost cages are still catching fish. And um, when, when the fish is catched, um, or another animal, and it, and it will die in the net, it attracts other underwater life. And uh, that, that makes it a sort of visual circle of death. We call it actually the circle of death because it's spontaneously attracting and the new animals who are actually scavengers who are coming to the nets to eat the dead, uh, the dead animals or fish, yeah, they will get entangled too. And this is, this is actually what this ghost fish is doing. It's just fishing gear unattended left in the ocean. And how does it get in there? Is it sort of thrown overboard? Is it garbage? Is it sort of something that got caught on a rock and was hard to retrieve or all of the above? Actually, all of the above. Um, you know, the most of it, it's not, it's not lost on pur purpose. And, you know, it's very easy to get snacked on the water. You know, on the water, it's not always flat. You know, in the, in the Dutch North Sea, we have quite a flat sandy bottom. But the objects there, like stones, like lost containers, like shipwrecks, whatever, what we call objects, by the way, um, they, are, they are there. Uh, yeah, okay, but when, a, when a fisherman is coming over it with his net, it's easy to get entangled. And uh, the majority of the fishing nets we still encounter in the Dutch North Sea, for example, is, is a legacy. And that's because in, well, decades ago, um, the navigation, GPS, IES, was not so good. The, the, the equipment they had to avoid those objects. And they were also not really marked on, uh, on the maps. And uh, these days it's a lot less, but still it's, it's happening that sometimes a fisherman will catch a object and loses his net. So yeah, it is happening uh, not on purpose, uh, but we often also see that sometimes a reparation, yeah, reparation I call it, when, when a fisherman is fishing, fixing his net, they're cutting out the pieces on sea and they fix it. And those pieces we sometimes find back on the water and at the beach. So unfortunately it's also, I don't say that they throw it in, but it, it's ending up in the sea for another reason. Hmm. And Letharis, how much would you say this issue is because of old fishing practices that need to be renewed, traditional practices that need to be updated? Well, to a great extent, that's, that's the case. You know, the, the problem with the fishing nets, it's, you know, they are made from plastic and actually they are made from one of the strongest uh, plastic materials that we have. So uh, it's, it's very cheap to use and very effective. Imagine that a net, when it turns to a ghost net, it needs six centuries to turn into micro, microplastics. So it's really, it's really solid material. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's not realistic to speak that uh, about replacing the nets, but yes, uh, we need to replace the fishing techniques. The um, challenge is that until, you know, slight, recently, uh, fishermen and the stakeholders that were not really aware about the damages of this material. Uh, I have fishermen that, that we work with and they were saying to me, ah, it's not a problem, you know, fish grow in there, grow in the plastic in the sea. And then when they realize what's going on, they are shocked. So on the one hand is uh, awareness raising within the fishermen. And the other is 
actually the waste management. In many of the ports, this is in the Mediterranean, where fishermen operate, the port authorities, they cannot manage uh, the fishing nets. So many times they just say to the fishermen, you know, do it, uh, do, do something with that. Uh, many times I've seen also myself, uh, you know, people burning the nets because there's no other solution. So we really need to, to come to them with a solution for this challenge. And I think this is what we and Pascal and Healthy Seas are doing. Definitely. You talked a little bit about the damages. Let's take a pulse on the situation. What is the damage that's being done? Has the issue of ghost gear gotten worse? I know fish stocks are already so depleted around the world, but where do we stand? Let's take a pulse on this issue. Pascal? Uh, for me, it's hard to say if it's getting worse or it's getting less worse. Uh, I cannot really see that. Um, from a diving point of view, when we come down on wrecks and we often visit the, the same wrecks, we see that it's getting less because we are working on the fishing gear uh, already for a while. But we have to say that there is also coming back certain types. Uh, and that's the same actually happening in, uh, in the Mediterranean where we are also very active. Um, but this is actually a very, very small part of what we see. Uh, we are aware that in, in, in all the world's oceans, you know, the, 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 the areas we are coming is very small if you compare it to where the problem is. Because in, I always like to say every single sea where there are fishermen, there is ghost gear guaranteed. It's not even a question. So it's very complicated to say for me what if it really is getting less or not. And it's I don't know if Lefteris has something to say about this. Uh, I think I will have a more optimistic approach in that. So let's say, you know, about the ghost gear problem, uh, if, if we break it down, it's actually two causes. The one is that currently there's a lot of ghost gear in the sea. And the other one is that there's more ghost gear entering the sea. So on the one hand, healthy seas, ghost divers, and, and we, we, we try to remove this material. And on the other side, uh, we, have, we are trying to prevent more ghost gear entering the sea. So uh, already we collaborate with the biggest uh, fishing ports uh, of Greece and some of the biggest ports of Italy. And some of, the, of these areas, they were the main pollutants of ghost gear to the sea. Uh, every year we collect tons and tons of nets that if we didn't collect them, they would end up there. So I'm optimistic that by, you know, stopping the inflow of, of ghost gear to, to the sea, uh, then we can minimize it just to the ghost gear that is generated from the damages. And even that, uh, many of the fishermen that we work with now, when they, when they lose nets, they put a mark on the GPS and the next day they go there and they cut the nets. So... We try to minimize new ghost gear as much as possible and with the efforts of divers and fishermen get this material back. So I'm optimistic about the future and we have to be. And a good thing is like that the EU has finally seen the problem. So there's new legislation about uh, prevention of uh, you know, uh, pollution from ghost gear. So I, I believe that uh, finally we are in, in a good way uh, there's a lot of work needs to be done, but uh, yeah, I can see I can see the future with some hope. That's brilliant. But it sounds to me as long as there's fishing, there's work to be done, and and this is a continual thing that you guys are working on. Pascal, can you take me back to the first time you went on a dive to retrieve ghost gear? I know you've been doing this for years and years. You are an amazing technical diver, but can you take us back to that first dive? Um, yeah, it was actually already happening the moment I started diving. Um, we are, I think we have to go back to 2007. Uh, when I started North Sea diving, then the effect was clearly visible for me. Um, uh, North Sea diving means diving on shipwrecks only because we have no reefs, we have no, no rocks, no nothing. We have only shipwrecks to look at. And uh, those shipwrecks are already since decades collecting fishing nets, like we already explained. So when you dive a wreck in the North Sea, you will have lost fishing gear guaranteed. And it doesn't matter. It can be a trawler net, it can be a gill net, it can be sport fishing gear, which is also very popular in the Netherlands. So you are, it is always 
bothering you. It's there, okay? And you can try to ignore it, but at one point, you're, you know, in, in my case, I got annoyed by it. And uh, with the divers, we were then uh, organizing uh, days of diving on the North Sea. Uh, we started to collect it. Just like, uh, okay, let's, you know, do something and collect it a little bit. So it was one dive uh, on a day. And then it ended up in project dives. And this project got a little bit more attention. Uh, we got funding at one point, and at one point we started up a project to clean up the Dutch North Sea. And yeah, from that point on, it only, you know, at one point I just stopped diving on the North Sea for fun and just only for this purpose. And that's actually how it happened. And was there a per particular interaction with an animal or with something that really, that you rescued that really had an impact on you and that kept you going? Uh, let's say, yeah, I, I got that question quite often. Uh, in the Netherlands, that's a very uh, complicated thing because uh, the weather uh, can really mess up our dive. So that means that uh, we cannot go very often to the same place back. So if there is something happening and an animal is stuck, the chance that we will be there on time is very, very small. Uh, most of the time it's dead when we arrive. And uh, so, but several times I encountered and that sounds very simple, but I encountered uh, live cods. So fish still alive in sport fishing gear. And even that is hitting me, you know, you, you come down there and you see fish struggling in lost sport fishing gear, trying to get out, but they can't because the, fear is the gear is lost. They, they grab the hook and they are still there. They are waiting to die. And you can see that they are stressed. So the moment we release those animals and you really feel the stress in those animals, the moment you, you release them, they just, most of the time they, they, they are swimming circles because they are completely, you know, out of control. For some reason that does something to you. So yes, it, it, it hits me. Uh, it really touches me the moment, the moment we have an animal down there. But um, unfortunately, most of the time it's too late. Yeah, wow, I, I can really feel that. And Lefteris, you're saying that you come from a long line of fishers, you know, that's your background. Do you remember the first time you approached your family and said, hey, I think I wanna change this industry and I think I wanna do things differently. How did that conversation go? Yeah, I have this conversation quite clear in my head. They said, that's a stupid idea. So go back to what you were doing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my, my, my family, you know, my father and my cousins and stuff, they didn't really, you know, in the beginning believe that we can actually change the fishing techniques or the mindset in the fishing sector. So they, they didn't really approve of the idea. So what I did is like I was working in the project uh, secretly for, for many months until it was ready to launch. And, and, and now I think, yeah, they are one of the biggest fans because, you know, what we do and what we are trying to do with the fishermen is we're trying to create solutions that are win-win for them and, and the environment. So because I come from these communities, I can understand them. If you say to a fisherman, fish less, um, he will be stressed. He has a family to maintain, you know. Probably what he will do is fish more, but fish more illegally. So you need to find some solutions for him. Uh, and this is what we've been trying. Like uh, we teach them like to earn more money while the fish less, we teach them techniques such as fishing tourism. And also we teach them how to fish plastic from the sea and bring it back. Uh, so they are really excited about that. And also they are excited that they are part of a, a, a movement. You know, they, they, they really love that. And based on your previous questions on what you asked Pascal, um, we collect a lot of uh, ghost nets from the sea. Actually, usually 30% of the total plastic we get from the sea is, is ghost nets. But by the time they arrive to us, uh, they, are, they are full of uh, skeletons, to be honest. Dead fish, uh, dead marine mammals. Yeah, we, we, we get that often. So yeah, it, it, it's a really sad picture to see and it's something that motivates you to, to do more. To be, to be honest, most of the ghost nets that we get because the fishermen fish like uh, deeper than 50 meters from the sea. Uh, is from previous decades. We get many nets that they are now banned for already 20 years. It's, it's uh -huh. crazy what, what we get from the sea. Yeah, we, we, have, yeah. we, have, we have the same. We, we, sometimes we find complete beam trolls in the Dutch North Sea. 
And um, we had several times that we worked together with a, with a salvage company and we pulled out that complete beam troll with the beam, with the shoes, with everything and the, 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 the bobbins, the, the chains, everything. That's a very big gear. And we, when we bring it on land, the fishermen were looking at us and they came to us and they said, gee, that's even older than my grandfather. <laughs> I never saw this alive because, you know, it was already so long down there. So that's already, you know, this kind of input, feedback from those fishermen that's really helping us. I mean, you guys both have such strong links to fishing communities. And you're right, Lefaris, to say to a fisherman or fisherwoman, uh, you can't fish right now or you need to fish less is difficult. But how do you even have that conversation during the coronavirus when everybody's jobs are impacted even more? How has COVID affected the work that you guys are doing? Well, yeah, that's, that's a challenging question. Uh, in the beginning, we were at shock you know, not only about uh, our operations, but about everything. I, I remember the first week of lockdown in Greece, we lost 40% uh, of our revenue. So we are like, what's going to happen in the next weeks, you know? Um, so we, we couldn't go to the ports anymore. Most of the fishermen, and sorry for saying fishermen, but uh, out of the thousand guys that we work with, uh, only one is a woman. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but most of them, uh, they are, uh, you know, guys over 65 years old uh, with uh, health issues, so we, we couldn't be to the port. Um, so what, what we did is um, we took a step back. So we realized, uh, we thought actually, what can we do and what we cannot. I was really uh, stressed and uh, depressed from the pandemic. And then, you know, I thought to myself and we discussed as a team, can we change the pandemic? No. Can we change the lockdown? No, we can't behave as uh, you know uh, safe as possible for our, ourselves and our families. But we cannot change the fact that we have a lockdown in a pandemic. So what can we change? And what we did is we started uh, calling with these different communities, discussing with them, and actually asking for feedback. What can? What are we doing well? What should we improve? And this was a shock. We got so many inputs. And we improved our work so much uh, that we actually were able to quadruple in impact and uh, employees the last months during the pandemic because our work started and to become so much better. One of the things that we changed from feedback that we received from the fishermen is that, hey, why don't you got, have a local guy here to manage the port? Why do you have to come all the time here? So this is what we did. We have... Uh, part-time people in all of the ports that we operate. So these guys, they, uh, they have the daily communication with the fishermen. And this made our life so much easier. And the plastic that we collect from the sea so much more. So this is a way that we adapted. We realized what we can, what we cannot do. And then we had this approach of empowering the local communities. And it, it worked. That's incredible to turn things around like that. What about you, Pascal? What's it like running an NGO during, you know, a global pandemic? Um, well, th th there is a lot of there's a lot of work to do, actually. You know, uh, running an NGO is not only when, when I, I often get the question, you know, the, the work you guys are doing is so amazing. We only see you guys diving and on trips and on, uh, sometimes they call it holiday because they have no clue that actually when we go on a, on a project week, it's everything but the holiday because we are working from nine till 12. Um, but again, it doesn't really matter. Um, um, yeah, well, there's so much more to do. We are now working on webinars. We are working on revising procedures. We are working on, uh, actually, we didn't stop work on projects because we have our whole list for this, this year already ready in detail. Uh, because, yeah, you never know. If the pandemic goes on now for half, half a year, we just move on uh, our projects, but if we postpone them. But if it now stops, we have to be ready. We cannot think the moment the pandemic stops, like, oh, wait, we have to do something. Let's find out the project. No, we have to be ready. So we make sure that we are ready. Uh, in the meantime, we have a lot of work to do, like equipment maintenance. Um, with health and season goes diving, we just got our own vessel donated in the, the Netherlands. So as if we didn't have anything to do, we now have, because now we have to do maintenance on the boat and make sure that the vessel is ready for, uh, for this upcoming season. So there is so much to do. 
That's incredible. Pascal, if you, if you want to handle the boat, I used to do maintenance and fishing boat. So, you know, count me in for that. <laughs> oh, you're you're more than welcome. I know that you are now right right now in the Netherlands, so uh, it's not so far from you. We will we, we will keep in touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will remember my youth years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, and, and something else I wanted to say here, and, oh, <laughs> like you, during the pandemic with with Pascal and Health, this is actually what we did is we started working with hundreds of fishermen in Italy and we prevented like uh, tons and tons of, of used fishing equipment from becoming ghost gear. So yeah, the pandemic is a challenge, but I think it's how you adapt to this challenge that, that really matters because everybody's facing the same problem here. Yeah. Absolutely. Tell me a bit about your relationship. I mean, you guys come from very <laughs> different worlds. At some point you might've been maybe a little bit, you know, not friendly with each other because you know, the fishing community is a real challenge for Pascal and the work that, he, that he's doing. When did that bridge first create and, and how did you guys meet? Well, maybe I, will, I should start with that. So one day <laughs> I received a weird phone call about from some people from the Netherlands interested in the old nets of the fishermen. So, you know, it was like a few months after we started in Alia and I was, I was thinking, why is everybody you know wants to be interested in, in lost nets so yeah we met in our offices in, in Piraeus in Greece so this is how we first met and I was really surprised by the people that I met you know I was expecting to find I don't know something something different uh, and I was surprised to find people that wanted to create solutions to actually solve problems I was surprised to see people looking to to create synergies and th that was nice and over the years so we've been back and forth in Greece and the Netherlands uh, we went out together and stuff so I think we got to know each other pretty well uh, but yeah it was really a random phone call that happened three or four years ago something like that it's already four years ago I believe it must be something like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and how did that relationship change your narrative and the way that you look at garbage? Because what you were first retrieving and thinking, well, this is, you know, a bunch of trash has now got a whole new economy and story to it. When did that doorway in your mind first begin to open? For me, it opened yeah. when, uh, uh, yeah, when, when, when we met Health Disease and when I've been to the Netherlands and saw the work they're doing in the port. So, you know, uh, Pascal and, and Veronica, they drove me around to the ports that they work. I saw the nets that they collect. I saw the process that they upcycled. And I was like, hey, we, we can do the same in Greece. Uh, and let me be more clear on that. My father and the other fishermen uh, from the port of Piraeus, they, they have been complaining every year, every year, that lost fishing net enters their propels and creates a lot of damages and... They pay thousands of euros for that. So what should we do and what should we do and nothing was going on. And then, you know, I saw like a successful solution. And then we were like, that would be cool to do that in Greece. Why not? Like, it's, it's not so hard to say to the fishermen, yeah, in, instead of throwing it to the waste, just put it aside in a, in a big bag or something. And then we can collect it. And yeah, this was... Um, this was the time, I think, you know, when when I actually saw it uh, working, to be honest. That's brilliant. And Pascal, it's not just about collecting the nets, is it? Thanks to Healthy Seas and, and your partners, there's a whole other industry, a whole other creative industry that has been born out of what many people consider to be garbage. What is, in your perspective, the most beautiful thing that you've seen created out of abandoned fishing gear? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's complicated, uh, but I like to answer this in a way of the reason we exist is because of, uh, we want to expose the problem. And uh, this is, this is not really in line in what I do for health disease, but, uh, if you ask me if something is really connected to exposure, then it is when an artist makes something out of recovered fishing gear and tries to attract the attention of the public. And we have seen it a few times now, and especially the one in Malta, it was Jennings Falzon, I, I can remember his name. 
he really made a sculpture out of it with, with freshly recovered fishing gear and that, that really hit me. I was like, okay, if you were standing in front of that sculpture, you're thinking, oh my God, even if you do not know what's going on here, you now know because it was expressing that. And um, the, the rest, what we are doing with how to seize, um, yeah, indeed, we work a lot with partners and a lot of materials are used are from regenerated nylon. Uh, but that is not, you, you cannot touch it like that. It is a, it's very important that it that it's, that it's happens and that the, the material is reused and there are new products out, made out of it. But if you ask me personally, I like it when there is something made out of the fishing nets and you can still see that it was fishing net. Just like, for example, uh, brace nets. Brace nets are, you know, those, 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 those very nice brace nets were sold from, uh, from, uh, from Germany. Um, that's a conversation starter. You know, if you if you buy an accessories like that and you're sitting on a on a birthday and people are looking at that and they, they recognize it, they don't have really a clue what it is and they think, okay, okay, let's ask. Okay. So they ask you, what what's that? It looks like a piece of fishing net, right? And then people say, Yeah, you know, it's it's a brace net and it has to do with ghost gear. And then the whole conversation starts and you reach public who would actually maybe never would ask something like this or even ask themselves. And that's what I like when it's connected to spreading the world into the ocean, of, uh, into the world, because that is exactly what we, why we are actually starting, and that's exactly why we are doing it. Because to be honest, yes, we remove lost fishing gear, and yes, we save an animal, and yes, certain spots in the world are less with lost fishing gear. But our main goal is exposing, because we have to start somewhere else to stop this problem. We are di we divers, we can uh, uh, mobilize as many groups as we want all over the world, but we are not going to stop this problem. Mm. And, and now that you have a vessel and you're expanding and you're connecting with other communities around the world, what's a hot spot that you would love to get to that you know is really suffering? Uh, yeah, well, I can be very simple about that. That's actually every wreck in the North Sea. So um, we were in so far, we were also very depending on uh, on charters in the Netherlands. Uh, we have to uh, we have to book them. Uh, you know, we have to we are on a schedule, and sometimes they have time, sometimes not. And, you know, you, it's very depending. If the weekend is is good weather, then we can go out. But if it's bad weather on a Saturday, and we have booked a trip on a Saturday, but on Sunday it's nice weather, you know, then then it's a no go for us. So. At this stage, we are very happy with our vessel because now we can go whenever we want. And again, uh, I don't really have a preference. In the Netherlands, every wreck is a problem. So we can go out as much as we want. And I already have a few ideas in my mind where we will go out the moment we are ready. That's brilliant. And Lefteris, tell me a little bit about Analia. How do you convince someone who's a longtime fisher from a longtime fishing family that they need to go back to school? How do you entice them? And what's the payoff for them? Well, uh, Analia actually has two target groups. So the one is uh, unemployed people. So what's in for them is uh, getting a job in the fishing sector. Uh, most of them, they go to the fishing tourism sector. So this is the one for them. And uh, for the professional fishermen, the game is uh, um, two things. The one is learning to, to fish better, which increases their income. So fishing tourism is a technique that we teach them how to do that, like getting tourists on the boat and instead of catching 100 kilos of fish per day, catching just five kilos, uh, cook it for the tourists and have a nice experience and they get much more money from this experience. And through that, you know, the turtles and the dolphins that used to be fishermen's uh, worst enemy, now it's his best friend because it's a sightseeing during the whole fishing trip. So that's the one thing. And the other thing is with the plastic, we get a, a, a reimbursement to the fishing communities for the plastic that they collect. So for them, it's much better to bring the plastic uh, in the port than living in, in the sea. But just that's just the, the layout. The most important thing is the story. Uh, we are trying to create a story where the fisherman is now not the bad guy, but one of the guys that's trying to solve the problem. Because these guys, they, they love the sea and they really want to protect it because they live from the sea. Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't forget uh, what uh, a fisherman now in one of the new ports that we opened in, in North Beach told me. He told me that in the beginning, before we started our work there, 
that he doesn't believe you know that plastic and fishing nets is such a problem there. It's something that always was like that. And after a week, when all of the fishing boats of the of the of the port started bringing plastic back to the port, most of it uh, ghost nets and stuff, uh, he told me. Wow, I haven't realized the damage that we have done to the sea. Uh, it was this moment that I saw all of the fishermen bringing plastic and filling the port with plastic that I realized the extent of the damage that we are causing there. And he said, yes, now I blame myself because I live from the sea. I love the sea. How could I do that? So this is how we engage them. Uh, making them a part of a positive story, giving them a solution and uh, helping them to have an impact. And to add on what Pascal said before about the most beautiful product that it's made from ghost nets, uh, I will have a different perspective. So for me, it is when I give to the fishermen uh, products that are made from, from nets, because you know in, in our circles and the fishermen circles, nets is, is the usual. But seeing uh, socks or swimming suits from something that they collected from the sea or from something that they didn't burn, uh, it's so emotional and so powerful. Like uh, I gave socks to the fishing community where we collected their nets and the women of the fishermen, they started directly trying on the socks to see if they are good. And then they were like, oh, they are really good. <laughs> and uh, I remember we felt this is we gave a, a swimming suit to a fisherman in Piraeus who collected the most nets. It was like a, a girl swimming suit, and he was like a gigantic guy, you know. He was laughing so hard from that he, he gave it to, to his nephew that uh, in the next month he brought all of his fisherman friends, and all of them now they collect the nets from us for us. So, you know, creating a positive story. Uh, creating real impact and giving them a solution. This is the way that, that we work. Yeah, I, I must. Uh, I have to. I have to jump in here because uh, I, I realize that what you say is absolutely true. Of course, uh, the, I answered my question from a very pers personal point of view. Okay, like exposure. But I experienced exactly the same with you experience when we are walking in uh, fishing uh, fishing harbors, and we do that quite often. Then uh, people are starting to know us. And they, the fishermen are coming to us, and uh, first of all, they start to, uh, yeah, you know who we are, so, uh, it's, it's the fishermen. Um, but uh, you are the guys who are making socks and uh, brace nets out of it, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you have them? Well, you know, you can buy them online and stuff. We give them a sort of uh, flyer or whatever. Sometimes I have them in my car, so I, I give them to them, you know. But that, that really works. You, uh, for sometimes you just uh, you attach them to the story. And we often get just invites that they just say, okay, okay. Hey, that's, that's cool. And um, do you have another one for my daughter? Yeah, okay, well, we give another one. And then say, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, have, uh, have a trip on my fishing vessel soon, just call and you know you're more than welcome and this is what we want we want to be you know connected to each other so i really recognize what you are saying that's really working i like that yeah. it's really about building relationships isn't it and just to think out of that garbage the beautiful things that are created you know the whole new economies creativity and expression that's coming out of this garbage is for me what's most exciting we've got some really good questions that i want to throw to both of you um Richard and Martin have sent some really great questions. So let's start with Richard's question. He would like to know, what does a fisher person do with unwanted fishing gear? And like, do they just lose it over side or do they get worried that they've lost something that's of value and try to go back and retrieve it themselves? So it depends on the occasion, it depends on the country. Um, let's say in the Mediterranean that I know of, the standard procedure is that uh, the majority of the, of the old fishing nets that they come from you know, repairing the net. So this is the majority. So the procedure now uh, in most of the Mediterranean ports is that they, they give it to the port authorities or the municipality, and then they uh, bury it or burn it. So that's the main procedure, let's say. Uh, if currently the fishermen that we work with, if they lose a big piece of uh, fishing nets in the sea, they try to, to, to catch it back. So now they, they have this kind of mindset. And currently we replace the old procedure that I just described with 
having a person in a report and we have like these uh, big bags, simple big bags. And we just put the old nets there, we put to the port and, you know, once in a while we collect it, we have it in a warehouse. And from there, you know, we send it to health issues. And this is then into the circular economy. So this is now the new process. And to be to, to share some numbers, we work already with 65% of uh, Greece fishermen, which is a big number. And we, we are trying to, to make a movement from that. So yeah, I hope I could answer the question. <laughs> Definitely, because ultimately that's their money that's going overboard as well. Like those nets yeah. cost something and that's, you know, their bottom line. So it's- yeah, just, to, just to give you an example, sorry for interrupting, like yeah. a big fishing net may cost up to 20,000 euros, wow. you know? So if, if they lose it, it's a lot of money. So they will try to retrieve it, uh, especially if it's in a good condition. Yeah, and, and not only that, because um, uh, what people often do not realize, it's not only catching fish. Uh, Lefter has already mentioned it, but it's also ending up in the prop of your vessel in many times. But uh, what is also happening is that um, fishing gear catches fishing gear. So when, yeah. a net, when a net is lost, when a line is lost, when a cage is lost and there is a net coming over it, it will get snagged too. And then everything is down there. So we, we quite often find a whole bunch collection of several types of fishing gear, which is floating through the ocean, which is catching continuously, continuously, continuously already for decades. And you think how on earth did it hit each, uh, hit, uh, catch up with each other? But that's how it works because it's catching each other. So it's very, it's not all, yes, it's cost them money by losing the gear, but it will cost them money again because they got snack in the gear, which is lost. Exactly. We got a big ball of what Pascal is describing a few days ago from the Aegean Sea, like a super, super big ball of lost fishing gear. It's crazy. Like the one was cut together. And the fishermen, they are saying to us that there are many areas in the Aegean Sea that they don't fish anymore because there's so much lost fishing gear in, in the bottom of the sea that it just destroys their, their equipment. And it, it's crazy. We are speaking about kilometers of lost fishing gear that it's together in huge bowls and everything that goes there just, just dies. And it's too deep to, to clean it currently with our current know-how. So yeah, that's, 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 that's really weird. Well, let's let's talk solutions. Martin would like to know the details. Like, what are the instruments, the techniques, the materials? What's the future of fishing, and how do we make it profitable for the fishers, but also less damaging to the ecosystems? Uh, there are there are many parameters to that. Let's say so. Yeah, the main one is to fish sustainably, and for you know consumers to to buy you know sustainably as well. So I think that's that's the main thing. Um, like avoid you know uh, fees that comes from illegal fishing activities and and such. Uh, for for the fishermen themselves, I think one big part will have to be fishing tourism. Like in Indonesia, they, they were struggling with the manta rays back in two thousand eleven because they were fishing a lot of manta rays. And then the Indonesian government, they, they passed a law that you're not allowed to fish manta rays anymore. And then they changed it into fishing tourism. And uh, now the manta rays population is back to normal. And also the income of these, village, of these fishing villages, let's say a manta ray would cost like a hundred dollars to sell it. And now one manta ray gives $1 million back to the community from the sightseeing of the tourists around the, the uh, the fish. So that's the one thing. And the other thing is, uh, yeah, uh, fighting uh, ghost gear. It really creates huge damage to the fishing sector. So by preventing ghost gear and by collecting whatever we can from the sea, I think that's, uh, that's the brightest solution for sustainable fishing at the moment, at least in the Mediterranean, because marine plastic pollution and mainly ghost gear is the main danger that uh, the fishing community is facing. Right. What about our own diets? Pascal, is that something we should be thinking about? Are we consuming way too much fish? Uh, can we at home do something starting now? Uh, that's always a challenging question. You're getting on the tough ones. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Well, you know, I really think that uh, let's start a little bit bigger. I think that we are with too many people on the planet. So uh, you, can, you can explain it as, do you think we consume too much fish? 
Mm, I think yes, we do, but that's not only because we are catching too much fish, but that's because we are with too many people on our planet. Um, yeah, you know, if you want to ask it for me personally, uh, I I stopped eating meat already several years ago. Um, I think there is a, a huge impact on the on the environment and on the climate uh, for sure. Uh, I also reduced uh, fish very very much. Uh, I'm living in a fishing village, so and I like fish, but yeah, I think that. Uh, the, a change starts with yourself. So I really think that uh, people really should uh, stand in front of the mirror and look at themselves and think, oh my God, um, what can I do to change this myself? So I want to put it bigger. I think that actually the world is getting too much overpopulated. And that's why we are just, we are just grabbing everything we can find in the world to eat. That's what we are doing. And no matter what it is, it's fish or meat or whatever, actually. Yeah, every in industry is impacted. Um, you guys, we've got about 15 minutes left. If anybody from our audience has any questions, please jump in the Q&A and throw them in there and I'll be sure to ask as many as I can. Um, but there is, people still want more details on how to prevent those gear from re-entering the sea. Everybody's really hungry for this information, which is amazing. But what are some of the most successful strategies to have fishermen working together to reach such a goal? And that question is from Pedro. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, <laughs> that's also a nice question because for example, maybe in the same port, uh, they are like, we have some ports in South Greece and Crete. There are like uh, 10 fishermen and five, and they are divided in a group of five and they hate each other. So <laughs> how can you convince two different groups of working together? Uh, again, it's uh, providing them with uh, a solution that works, a solution that is win-win for them and the environment. Like if they understand that by doing something that is not harmful to them and it's actually helpful to the environment, every logical person is going to do that. So that, that, that's it. It's not some, some magic or some extreme science that we do. It's simple logic. And we, we, we just, what, what we really do is we try to, and we do what we promise. So if we promise them a bean, we have a bean there on time. If we promise them bugs, we have bugs there on time. And the most important is uh, we try to, to lead with uh, our examples. We, we, we try to, to pass the change as well, like I, I stopped using single-use plastic. So, you know, I, I said to the fishermen that, you know, as, you know, as lifters, as an individual, I'm also trying to help them. I'm, I'm also on the same page. Uh, it's really not, not something really weird, like build some trust, have some basic equipment to collect the nets, and then you just send a, a, a truck, put it in a main warehouse, and then you send it for uh, recycling. It, it's really not difficult. Everybody can apply, apply the same technique to his own communities. And if they do lose control of a net, then what happens? What are the steps to try to get it back? Uh, well... There, you know, you must be lucky, first of all, uh, first of all, that the currents, they didn't take the nets away. So they put a mark and then the next day they throw the nets again and they try to cut. Um, and this, uh, this is a thing, eh? like we, we collect a lot of plastic from, from the bottom of the sea and about a third of it is ghost nets. So fishermen using nets, they cut nets. So th that's a thing that's kind of an inception, but it's, it's happening. Right. Do you see more relationships between fishing communities and diving communities? I mean, how cool would it be if they were close with local divers and divers could help out with retrieving that gear? Is this a relationship we're going to start to see around the world? I think we should. I think we should. Um, I think both the fishing sector and the diving sector, it has some, you know, uh, challenging personalities. And in the past, they, they were not like extremely synergies between them uh, but I believe by that by working together they can do amazing stuff that that none of them could do on its own so uh, at least in Greece uh, fishermen are there very willing to to work with divers they really appreciate when they clean you know their areas they port sometimes they, they are really ashamed of what's taking out of the sea and divers you know they, they can do stuff that the fishermen can't they can dive deep there in 30 40 50 meters and, and cut these nets and bring it back. Like, I, I cannot do that. And 
that, that's the remarkable thing of synergies. Like uh, separately, we cannot do what we can do together. Pascal, what do you think of that? Yeah, well, this is very depending on the country. Um, uh, in our country, we do not we do not have a problem with each other. Um, uh, I, I, ha I have some stories from several countries around the Mediterranean, which uh, the fishing community is. I don't want to use the word aggressive, but I do. Uh, they are. They, oh, they are. They are aggressive. Yeah, they, do, <laughs> they do not understand each other. You have to see it from that point of perspective. Exactly. Um, a fisherman is there to do his job. He wants to earn money. And that's what he wants. So what the diver is doing, it's first of all, most of them don't care. And um, when they are down there, they think, listen, I want to catch fish there. I don't want to have divers there because that's bothering me. Okay, it's just, they see it completely from another angle. And that is actually the same that we have in, in, in the Netherlands. If we are collecting fishing nets, we, we how much we try to involve the fishermen and try to give, okay, do you really want to do this? You know, do you want to do it for the environment? Do you want to do it for the recycling? Do you want to do it to make my spot? Majority will say, yeah, of course, you know, but if you look deep in their eyes, they are doing their job. They have a different starting point. And that is, that is, that's, that's will always be the difference between diving and between fishermen. It's just a different angle. Yeah. I mean, you guys model a really healthy relationship with a lot of respect and a lot of opportunity has been born out of your collaboration. So this could perhaps serve as a really strong international model for other communities that do want to come together. I'm getting a lot of questions from divers who may not be as experienced as you, Pascal, and probably a lot better than me, but who are interested in collecting ghost gear. What does it take physically to be able to do this challenging thing? Um, yeah, physically. Uh, first of all, uh, everything else that you do underwater, uh, more than uh, watching fish, is potentially a risk. So you are doing something underwater, and I don't like to use, use the word work, because then we are touching the area of commercial diving, but let's call it an activity. So all activity you do different than watching fish is something that will bring risks. Um, so our organization is actually explained it this way. The moment you are removing the large objects from the seabed and working with lift bags, from our point of perspective, with our experience we have, we say that you have to be a technical diver. And that has all to do with a different level of training we have. And we are used to work in teams. We are work, uh, used to work in, in very strict procedures and standards. And we are used to work um, with equipment underwater, which is actually not average, okay? So um, yes, recreational divers can be involved uh, and we like to make there a little level difference. Uh, recreational divers are perfect to clean up reefs, to pick up uh, materials which can be picked up by hand, put in a bag, but keep it a little bit low level. Uh, we all say that because we know what it takes to uh, lift large nets on the water. And we only want to be very careful because like we always say, you know, it's awful that there's a net down there. It's awful that it's catching fish, but it's not worth a human life. And to be honest, it can be very dangerous. Tell me a little bit, both of you about the weight. Marcella wants to know how much do these nets weigh? Um, yeah, and what it takes to physically carry it up. What if it's caught on a rock or something? Uh, that's very depending on uh, on the type of net, uh, of yeah, the size of net. I cannot really say. Sometimes we have a we have a net of a few hundred meters of length, and then it's a gill net. If you roll that up and you put it in a box, it's not so heavy because it's made of very uh, thin nylon. Okay, that's the net we actually saw in uh, Croatia gallery. Uh, that's the same type. So if you have a lot, you can have a lot of net of that. That's not so heavy. But we, we once we did a fish farming net in uh, Lipari uh, that was lost uh, in a storm. Uh, it was on a reef on 35 meters, and that net uh, we started to lift. Uh, we thought it was quite small, but it ended up to be three tons. That was one net. So it's very depending where it is, what type of net it is, how long it's there, what growth is on it, how it's stuck. I cannot answer the question so easy. Mm, I understand yeah. that. 
and uh, many times the nets absorb a lot of water, so it makes it you yeah. know much heavier. Exactly. Uh, like you can get a net of like uh, 500 kilos, and the next day is like 250 kilos yeah. like that. Um, yeah. So it, it, I, I would suggest you know uh, like. On top of what Pascal said, maybe sometimes some technical equipment like, you know, a machine to, to lift it up to be safer. Sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a great follow up question. Um, Pedro was wondering it sounds like a lot of the projects you're doing, Letharis, is dealing with small local fishing communities, but how do you tackle larger industrial fishing operations? Um, in the Mediterranean, we don't have large industrial fishing operations. Uh, the seas, too small for this kind of operations to happen. Um, but compared to Mediterranean startups, we work from the smallest fishing communities to the biggest one, from the smaller boats to the biggest boats. The smaller boats we work, they are like five meters. The biggest boats we work, they are 40 meters. Everybody, they have the same objectives. Everybody, they want to protect the sea. And even if they are not romantic, to keep on living from that. So they understand that you offer them something that's good for them. Uh, so from, from my experience, I think the, the, the biggest, uh, you know, the, the, the fishing operations are, uh, the more professionalism you can find and you can create like sometimes a better solution. It's, it's much easier, let's say, to find, uh, 10 companies in disguise rather than find 120 fishermen, uh, person by person in the port because we do both. So we're, we're trying to do both. Right. And Pascal, what do you think? I mean, it's easy to have relationships with your neighbors, with the fishing community around you, but what about when it comes to having a conversation with a large corporation that's doing a lot of damage? Uh, that's a complicated to answer because we hardly have these conversations. Um, the, the, the majority of the people we met, um, I live in the street with fishermen around me. I'm surrounded by fishermen actually. And that's a good thing because I like those guys, all of them, uh, but it's a different level. If I want to talk to, uh, uh, to a fishing organization, then I like to talk to the people high in the tree. But the people I usually talk to are the fishermen itself. They are connected to the organization or working for a certain organization. But no, we, we, we hardly can talk to these kind of people. That's really interesting. So the bottom-up approach, really local and individual relationships, it sounds to me is what you're saying is a more powerful approach and you can be much more effective than trying to knock on those steel doors that may never open to you. Uh, there's a lot of politics going on. Uh, that's, also, that's also a thing, you know, uh, when we start talking about lost fishing gear in the Netherlands, um, we get also a lot of comments back, yes, but you know, you guys with your lost fishing gear, we have the discard ban, we have the pulse uh, core ban. That's also a, a certain fishing technique with electro, uh, 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 what do you call that, electro beam, uh, which is banned now in Europe. You know, they have so many things in Europe which are already bothering them. The least concern at this moment is lost fishing gear. So it, it's always ending up the discussion because there's a lot more going on and that is mostly politics. And I understand, okay, because the fishermen in the Netherlands, I talk from the Netherlands now, they're having a rough time. Everything is, is, is connected to rules. And this week they were also announcing that they will get cameras on board to monitor them 24 seven if they have the correct amount of fish and uh, if they, they if they uh, obey the, the the discard ban seriously you know these people cannot even do their job anymore I, so it, it's a very complicated situation well i'd love for you guys to both share how people can get in touch because there's an overwhelming amount of eco warriors who want to support you yeah who want to get behind you and who recognize the badass work that you're doing. So please take a moment to let us know how we can find you and like, what can we do starting today to help you? So yeah, first of all, you can find us on our social media. It's uh, Analia, uh, you know, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, or my personal list, you know, you see it here. <laughs> so feel free to approach. Um, we would love to work with you, have, uh, you know, volunteers and opportunities do awesome stuff together. So yeah, let's, let's stay in touch. 
Yes, yeah, you know, uh, if divers all over the world or people are interested or maybe want to start a dive or whatever your connection is to this uh, subject and you want to know more about our work, you can visit our websites uh, from ghostdiving.org and healthdiseases.org. And I yeah, you know everything is on there from all social media uh, channels to we have tons of videos because everything we do is recorded. So, uh, and if you have any questions, all email addresses and contact options are on the website. And please, please do not hesitate to drop us a message. Absolutely. I would say the thing that's impacted me the most is starting to dive. And I know right now it's a little bit hard to do that, but once the world does start to open up again, diving completely changes your perspective when it comes to how you live, how you eat, even how you breathe. So that would be a nice place to start if it's ever available to you. That completely shifted my narrative. And if it wasn't for Pascal and Veronica at Healthy Seas, I wouldn't be a diver. So thank you to you guys. <laughs> it was an honor. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, you guys, for the wonderful discussion to all of our participants from around the world. Thank you for your questions and participating. Uh, hope to see you guys again in healthier and happier times. In the meantime, let's do our best for this planet and for each other. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much. Take care. Bye.